Next up will be uh, Dave Skaggs from uh, Cedars. He directs the uh, uh, Cedars Spine Program and uh, continuing uh, our theme of uh, more and more uh, pediatrics at this meeting. We're really lucky to have Dave here and um, he's done great work in ergonomics and safety in spine surgery and always has interesting takes on things. So Dave, please. Thank you, and thanks for putting together a great meeting. You know, it's remarkable how many more people are here right now than at 7.30. I don't know what happens in Vegas. So, so we're going to talk about robots and spine surgery, pearls and pitfalls. Here are the official disclosures, and here's the real disclosures. I have no money at stake in robots, uh, although I am developing a drill that I'll talk about later. I may make a few pennies on each drill bit. And the truth is, I don't use robots in more than 90% of my cases. I'll just slow things down. So I'm not rah-rah in favor of it. I'm just trying to take an honest look. And I know there's a lot of different people in the room, from trainees to experts. So let's just start from Robots 101. So all a robot does is point you in the right place and hopefully give you the right trajectory and the right depth. It doesn't do much more than that. It's not like a Da Vinci. It's pretty simple. And the key thing, though, is that the robot has to know where it is in space, and it uses various frames and other techniques to know where it is. This is the crucial point. And robots allow amazing planning. If you do the pre-op CT, you could sit there for days with your partners. You can think about things. Um, it's a great teaching tool, and I think it allows us to be more precise. I think it allows me to be more precise. And it gets to the point where you could actually spin a spine around a screw to make sure that, you know, for the spondy repair, you're not touching a joint above or below. You're not going to touch the nerve. You know, I can't believe I used to shoot these things in by hand. I wonder how many times I hit joints and didn't know it. And it's kind of cool. You could actually interop even move things around and change it as you see the surgery changing. You can line up the screws, makes it a lot easier to put the rods in, don't have to worry about bending. And you could even bring skin into it to make sure that you have one skin incision for multiple screws. Okay, but the interesting thing is the pitfalls. Um, we're gonna talk about frame shift pitfalls, which is similar to what Shane was talking about before with navigation, loss of proprioception, skiving, and deflection. So while robots are certainly popular now, um, I was forced to take a honest look at it because I've had six cases. Are we being recorded here, Chris? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. At an institution I'm very familiar with, we've had six cases of screws in the canal that had to be replaced. And thinking like, wow, this can't continue. This is pretty serious. And fortunately, there was no major uh, neurological injury, but it seemed like eventually there would be one. So we got our research team looking at this, tried to take an honest look. You know, we actually had to come to Jesus uh, grand rounds of like, hey, this can't continue. We have to change things now. And here's some of the stuff we learned. With, and, and I have to talk about Medtronic Robot and Globus Robot. Those are the two that I've used and have experience with. Um, I'm not promoting one or the other, but that's just, you know, they're different. And if we look at the Medtronic Robot, they had now different generations. And one would think that with each generation, it gets better and safer. safer. But what's interesting, the reoperation rate for misplaced screws seems to be getting higher over time. Now, why would that be? Well, if we're honest with ourselves, when people first start using a robot, it's marketing, it's cool, they're on stage, look at me, and they want to unconsciously or consciously say how good it is and get more speaking gigs and more patients. So there may be a little bit of bias that the people that are initially publishing on the robots are the people who are developing them and it makes everyone look good together. So I'm gonna give you a very honest viewpoint. You know, this comes on my desk, like, hey, look what happened here, you know, under my watch. Like, well, that doesn't look too good. I don't think we should be doing that. Uh, maybe in this particular case, there was a pelvic reference frame and screws are put all the way up to T10. That's a problem. Uh, most companies now say you should not go more than five vertebrae away from a reference frame. So there's one pitfall. And if you think about, there's a long distance sometimes from that reference frame into pelvis 
through a machine, through all kinds of stuff, you know, to the point of the screw. So there's many opportunities for something to shift, and we call it a frame shift. Uh, one solution to this is to look at the reference frame. So with one of the robots, if you only have one, with any robot, if you only have one reference frame and you accidentally hit it by a centimeter, every screw after that is off by a centimeter. But when you look at the screen, it looks perfect because the robot thinks the body is where the reference frame is. So one of the companies came up with an idea of like, hey, let's put in a surveillance marker that tells you if you hit the reference frame. So with this robot, if you hit the reference frame, it basically shuts down because the robot knows that there's a new distance between the surveillance marker and the reference frame. Um, and one of the things used both in you know, just simple navigation and robots is a spinous process clamp. When I first use this, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, this is not rigid. Spinous process clamps aren't rigid, you could bump them all the time, and if they're bumped five millimeters, every screw is off five millimeters. So if one is gonna use the spinous process clamp, use the second surveillance marker to know if the clamp has been moved or not. This is not that difficult, it just takes a little bit of time and thought and protocol. So here was a case done with the Globus robot, and this surgeon was gonna save time by not using a surveillance marker. You know, surveillance marker, 15 millimeter blade, bang it in, it's about a 15 second procedure. I guess they saved time by not doing that and put six screws out, including right into the pedicle, or right into the canal in the thoracic spine. Um, so one thing is anytime you're using a robot that provides both a surveillance marker and a reference frame, of course you have to use both. And now that's a protocol at Cedars. You're not allowed to use a robot unless you use both of those, you know, with this Globus robot. And people say, well, you know, it's two things that gets in the way. You know, I've done cases where you put them both in one iliac crest if you want to get them out of the way. They don't get in your way. It's not a big deal. Another thing you could do, particularly if it's a re-op or in the thoracic spine, is just throw in a thoracic pedicle screw and or attach to the rod, and then you have something rigid. That's a lot more rigid than a reference frame on a spinous process, which kind of like, you know, floats in the wind sometimes. So here's a case, another case of frame shift at L2. Now this isn't that strikingly bad to look at, but unfortunately a tap wrapped up a nerve root. This patient had permanent weakness as a result of a frame shift from a robot. Now, I know I'm in the minority in the spine world. I see no reason to use taps with pedicle screws. I think they have risk. I don't see any benefit to them. If a uh, tap was not used here, we don't think there would have been permanent injury to this nerve root. So I get another one. A drill was put right into the middle of the spinal canal, T10. No one wants to go. Wow, like how do good surgeons like us just stick a drill right into the middle of a spinal cord? And you know, if you think about it, we've all learned a certain amount of proprioception. We can feel when there's hard bone. We could feel when there's the soft cancellous bone. And we've learned a lot unconsciously as to how to put a drill bit or a lanky or a screw into the soft bone and avoid going into the canal. However, when you're forced to do this through this tube that sometimes looks like it's three feet long, you lose your proprioception. So all of a sudden, if you're gonna be putting, let's see if I can get this to work. If you're gonna be putting the drill bit here versus here, it feels the same. It's kind of difficult to feel exactly where you are through that big tube. So one thing that uh, we had a meeting with Columbia University and with Cedar sinai and east versus west. And one of the things we agreed upon is we probably should use a burr first and go no more than five millimeters deep. So there have been cases at a famous institution where a burr went right through the lamina. Whoa, I hit the wrong thing there. Let's see if we can go back. Where a burr went right through the lamina, right into the spinal cord and paralyzed someone. This happened in two patients at one famous institution. So how do we avoid that? One way is don't let a burr go forever because you have no proprioception with a burr. Just make it a rule that a burr only goes five millimeters deep, go in with the ball tip probe, and then go with the drill where you could have some proprioception. 
So one of the things I've uh, worked on designing, and I hope to get like one or two pennies every time you use this, so I'm clearly uh, have a disclosure here. This vibrates back and forth 367 times a second. And it doesn't hurt your fingers, you could put it on your tongue, it doesn't cut dirt, it doesn't hurt nerve roots, but what it does is it goes through cancellous bone like butter, and it almost doesn't go through cortical bone unless you try it. And I can't wait for everyone in the room to try this because it's really cool. I'm now gonna be using this for my open pedicle screws as well, not just drills, or not just a robot. So skiving. You know, everybody that learns robots talks about skiving like it's this horrible, awful thing. It's not that big of a deal. The way to avoid skiving is you go in with a round or side cutting burr. You gently go up and down a few millimeters at a time because if you just push a drill bit down, it will slide off the side. So you just need a side cutter, gentle up and down. That should solve the skiving problem. The other big problem we have is deflection. So remember, all a robot does is point you straight, like a laser. But what happens if there's soft tissue in the way that pushes it off to the side? Now, the robot should be able to tell you, hey, there's deflection here, you know, watch out, it turned red or yellow. But the other thing that we should do is know that we have to make an absolutely straight cut, feel it with your finger, from the skin, through the muscle, right to the bone. And if you're gonna be pulling with a retractor, that could move everything. So how do we get around this? A, a paper out of Boston Children's was great because it said about half the time, if you're doing a big spondy case, you have to make an extra incision to get L5. And if I'm doing a spondyloloptis case, did I pronounce that right? If I'm doing a case where L5 is way in the front and it's way deep hole, I'd say almost 100% of the time, I'm gonna make a separate one centimeter incision to put in that L5 pedicle screw. And as long as it's perfectly straight, I let the resident do it on the other side. It's become an easy screw, where it used to be one of the more difficult screws we did. So here's a case that I did incorrect. I hurt a child, I used a robot incorrectly here. And what I did, is when I was putting in the S1 L5 transdiscal screw, I wasn't smart enough to know at that moment that I moved S1 relative to L5. And when I put in the L5 drill bit, it felt funny, I saw a leg jump, EMG jump, and what happened is it was inferior because L5 was moved. Fortunately, just a little bit of dorsal foot pain, totally recovered, kids fine, but this is an example of how you could inadvertently move the spine and the robot won't see it. So one of the things we have to think about is how do we not move the vertebrae after the robot is set? And one of the things that's huge is retraction. So if we're gonna be retracting, retract first, then reset the robot and don't hesitate to use that chicken foot. You wanna use the chicken foot even on a spinous process or anything that you can see or feel to just make sure that what you're feeling with the chicken foot is what you're seeing up on the screen. And I would propose that we should do that every time we put in a screw. Why not? It takes like 30 seconds. So the workflow that I've developed in my institution, and I usually just use this robot for spondies and smaller cases, because the big deformity cases, you know, as I say, would just slow you up, is one, retract the soft tissue for a straight shot, get your retractor ready, tell your assistant, don't move no matter what. Next, adjust the robot. Uh, with the, with the uh, Globus robot, you just step on it, boom, the robot adjusts, it's in the perfect place. Then verify the anatomy with the chicken foot, make sure you're in the right place on the screen and in the same place in real life. Now this sounds like a lot of work, it sounds like it's gonna slow you up, doesn't it? As an example of why it won't slow you up, last week I did a anterior posterior instrumentation fusion spondylolisthesis, three hours skin to skin, front and back. Once you have this technique down, it is way faster. You do everything through these two centimeter incisions, just boom, boom, quick, done, out. But you have to take time to learn this. It's not that fast at first. Okay, so what we came up with at Cedars sinai was a robot safety protocol that has many levels of safety. So anytime we're using a robot, if you can have a surveillance frame and a reference marker, you have to use it. If you don't want to do that, you don't get to use our robot. 
If you're using a robot that doesn't have the surveillance marker, you have to then have a second thing, such as a clamp on the spinous process for navigation in addition to, say, a reference frame in the pelvis. So you have to have two things. And why not, before any time you put in a screw, just quickly check it with a chicken foot? It takes 30 seconds, very quick. After that, I think it's reasonable any time when the thoracic spine stimulate the screws. Why not? No downside, very fast. And I believe you shouldn't leave the OR unless you image the screws. Remember, what you see on the robot screen isn't necessarily what's going on in the human body in front of you. So Corey Walker is an MIS neurosurgeon. I feel like I'm doing my fellowship with him now. He's nice. He doesn't yell at me too much. Um, but what he tells me is, watch out for your rigid thinking. If you have MIS brain, it's very different from open brain. And I found myself learning MIS, getting into this weird quagmire where it's like, wait a second, I can make a two centimeter and bigger incision and this is easy. So it's not a failure to turn something into open, especially when you're learning. So let's go over a couple cases where I think that robots are good and talk about some pearls. 15 year old athlete, a year and a half of pain. You know, most spondies don't need surgery. I'm gonna say that again, most spondies don't need surgery, but sometimes they do. This kid who is hot right there, it hurt bending backwards, so we offered the child a direct repair. We made up something kind of new. We put in some HA-coated screws. You know, it makes sense, why not? And with the robot, we were able to plan one skin incision, uh, put in surveillance marker and the reference frame, you know, drill it in with lots of people looking to make sure we're in the right place. And what I think is really important, bring in fluoro also and feel it with your hand. So we have three different things, robot, fluoro, and palpation, all saying you're in the right place and stimulate the screw. Why not? You know, it doesn't take too long. So this kid was surfing post-op week two, two centimeter incision. You know, I never thought I'd be doing outpatient pediatric spine surgery, but now we can. This kid had so much less surgery uh, than I would have done it without a robot. So here's kind of cool. We got a uh, CT at five weeks. Honestly, maybe I was just curious. Want to see what it looked like, so did dad. Screws don't look too good. Looks like there's osteolysis. But you know what it is? HA coating. So it takes a while for the HA coating to ingrow. By nine weeks, you can see there's ingrowth. By 25 weeks, complete healing. Uh, kid is completely back to all sports. I think I've done this now about seven times and everyone except for the Major League Baseball players back to full sports. So here's the next case I did. I'm feeling pretty good about myself and I failed. I totally skived. And the reason why is the robot didn't plan that there was actually instrumentation already there so I didn't have a straight shot. This thing here was hitting the instrumentation. Now fortunately, we put in a ball tip probe who was way off. The robot screen said we were perfect, but it didn't feel good, it didn't look good. We just opened it up and fixed it the old fashioned way. So now what do you do if you have a larger gap? Maybe just putting a screw across it isn't enough. So here's a pretty cool thing you could do. You could make a phantom screw planned, so you pretend like you're gonna shoot a screw right into the spondy site. And then in what we do, is if you want to on the way in, you can grab some iliac crest bone graft or not. And then you put a wire right into the spondy site, pop some tubes down it, pull up a microscope, and you're right there in a very MIS fashion. You could even see the screw threads if you made the screw as big as it could. Pop some magic bone growing chemicals down there, iliac crest bone graft, and you fix this in a truly MIS fashion outpatient surgery. And here's what we look like at three months. It's healed. You can see there's not a lot of extra real estate there. These screws have to be perfect. And this kid is playing football three months later, bending backwards. No pain, doc. Why do you keep asking me that? So what do you do with a big spondy? This is another case where I think a robot makes your life so much easier. And I think now, after the learning curve, I believe it's safer for the kid as well. So this could all be planned out ahead of time. You know, one of the technical trips is, tips is you want the L5 uh, tulip a little bit high because that allows all the tulips to be at the same level for the rod. And what I've learned the hard way is you want to put in the 
L4 or 5 screw first and a pelvic screw pop a rod there. So then when you do the transdiscal screw, you don't separate it. It's already in place. And here, this was a gymnast who wanted a college scholarship. Two years later, she has her college scholarship, fully participating. This is what she looked like at three months. And uh, I know a lot of people now think you have to put L5 back on S1. And I believe, honestly, that's probably more surgeon ego than anything data-driven. We know that uh, from the groups in Scandinavia. You know, I think as long as you get L3 kind of parallel to the floor, as long as you get 34 or 5 degrees of lordosis, you're probably good to go. You know, I'd argue that she looks pretty good, and she certainly functions pretty well. I have not seen this construct fail in any athlete, and I've done a lot of Division I athletes and elite gymnasts. Um, so here's just one or two other things. Number three wrestler in the world. You see that lamina fracture? That's unusual. But he told me, he's like, yeah, this big Russian guy like threw me on my knee and I felt something break. And he also had a spondy. So he figured why not fix it all at once? And it was pretty cool to fix and plan that lamina fracture, just throw a screw in there. And he was unfortunately deadlifting 400 pounds in three months, but everything held up. And one of the other neat things you could do with the robot, you know, how do you know where to make the incision? So if you plan out, say, the S1 screw and the L5 screw, you literally look down the tube, draw with the marker where is the screw going to be, and then you can make your incision right between there. And so how do you get a robot? Robots are expensive. Hospital people, administrators, they don't want to buy you a robot, you know, because it's probably some like hip or knee robot in the corner that nobody uses and the administrators were burned. So one thing is you get other people to make the ask with you. You know, I got the trauma team and the trauma team now loves uh, fixing sacral fractures and SI joint problems. So the trauma team is a huge fan of the robot. Um, you know, adult surgeons love doing direct laterals and T-lifts, and I'm sure you guys have way more experience than I do. So you can get a whole bunch of people to think the robot's cool. And what we found was very helpful is to get the people who make robots and sell them to you in a room with your administrators, with the purchasing people and the surgeons, you know, give them three minutes to talk about it and have a show of hands how many surgeons are gonna use this. So since we've done it, I think admin and surgeons are happy. I think patients are getting better care for very, very select instances. It's not for everything. And I have to be honest, the real way we probably get admin to buy robots sometimes might be saying everyone else in town has it or it's marketing, uh, but I do think it's the future. So thank you very much. Yeah.